Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are connecting from. To our esteemed panel of speakers, members of the public, Expenditural and Financial Accountability Pepper Steering Committee, and public financial management practitioners who are connected, welcome to today's event on public financial management in the 21st century, harnessing data for better policymaking. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ed Oluwokere, the Global Director for Governance at the World Bank. And it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the PEFA Secretariat and the PEFA Initiative Partners. We are delighted to have you with us today as we launch first global report on public financial management that was prepared by the PEFA Secretariat. That so many of you are connected at this session serves as a reminder to us all just how important our work on public financial management is. Many of you will be familiar with the public expenditure and financial accountability known as PEFA initiative, or maybe specifically with the PEFA performance measurement framework known as PEFA. Some of you may know this very well or only to a limited extent. So let me provide some background information on PEFA. The PEFA program was initiated in 2001. So it has just turned 20 years old. It should therefore not be surprising to anyone connected today that we will be celebrating two decades of public financial management through the PEFA lens with major events all through this year, 2021. This event today is the first one to kick off the 20th anniversary of PEFA. Since its introduction, the PEFA program's performance measurement framework has been adopted by a wide range of countries, as well as international development agencies. And it has grown from a PFM diagnostic tool used by a limited group of donors into a gold standard PFM tool that country authorities use to monitor PFM performance and draw on to formulate PFM reform programs, often with support from international development partners. Over the past two decades, PEFA moved from strength to strength. Let me highlight three key areas that I'm particularly proud of. First, the country ownership of PEFA assessments significantly enhanced with PEFA getting mainstreamed as the primary analytical underpinning for government's public financial management reform strategies. Second, the quality of PEFA reports significantly improved with the PEFA check credentials. And third, PEFA assessments triggered thinking into emerging issues in public financial management. The PFM issues emerging during the pandemic makes PEFA even more important as countries battle the health, social, and economic fallouts uh, from the COVID-19 crisis. We have seen firsthand how countries with stronger and modern PFM systems were able to respond with ease when the pandemic uh, broke out, while some other countries struggled. The global report on public financial management presents the most comprehensive periodic examination of the state of PFM worldwide. Uniquely, it uses PEFA data to offer insights into PFM performance trends at the global, regional, and country level, as well as across key areas of the budget cycle. You will see in today's presentation that the report, which is only available online, contains a wide range of interactive data visualization short analysis and country examples that can be a resource for practitioners, policymakers, researchers, and other stakeholders. Now, let me take you through how we have organized uh, today's session. We have Oscar and Richard and Tia 
from the paper secretariat who will prevent, present the global report and give a synopsis of its key features. After the report is presented, we will convene a panel discussion with global PFM experts to talk about current and emerging PFM challenges and how we could better harness data to address some of these issues. The discussions will be moderated by Adenike Oyeyola, practice manager in the Governance Global Practice. We are honored today to have Mr. Francis Yamba, Secretary to the Treasury, Zambia. We also have uh, Selandra Patanayak from IMF and Joachim Wena from London School of Economics and Political Science with us as guest speakers. All three of them are esteemed specialists in public financial management. I now invite the team from the Peva Secretariat to present the highlights of the report. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ed. And thank you to everyone for joining us to launch this very important initiative. Uh, they, oh, let me just share my screen. So thank you again, everyone, for your attention. Now, as I mentioned, it, it, it is widely accepted that well-developed PFM systems are necessary for uh, the proper implementation of fiscal policy measures, as we can see in the current environment that we're currently facing. Consequently, many countries across the world have invested in a lot of resources in building strong PFM systems. But despite uh, the heightened focus on PFM over these last two decades, there's still very little literature on the aggregate performance of PFM. Um, in general, practitioners seem to be more or less very familiar with PFM performance from on a country by country basis. Also, there seems to be many one off publications that have commented on specific uh, PFM topics or may have captured PFM at particular points in time. But up until now, there has been no information source that gives a comprehensive periodic global view of PFM trends and performance. At the same time, the Secretariat, the PFM Secretariat, has cultivated a unique, rich database on PFM. And this database has largely been underutilized. Since its introduction, the framework has been used in over 675 countries to assess PFM systems worldwide. And as illustrated on this chart, you can see that the data is available in several by several different categorizations. So the question that we have had at the time of inception was this. Uh, what can we do with this abundant data on PFM performance? And more importantly, how can we as a secretariat facilitate learning in this regard? Well, for the very first time, we're happy to announce that we have analyzed all the available, publicly available data of, of, of um, PIFA data uh, in this, the very first global report on public financial management. And as Ed mentioned, it is an online report that will enable readers to browse through performance trends uh, across regions, across time periods, and across various functional aspects of PFM. The report has six main chapters, as is being displayed here on your screen. But for the purposes of today's launch, we will I will focus most, mostly on chapter three. And this chapter is where we present our analysis of PFM trends. So let's have a look at a few of the global trends in the report. Now, here, first of all, looking at regional statistics, it seems that countries in the East and Central Asia region are on average performing relatively better than others. Uh, a closer look at the data basically reveals that um, this is the case for all aspects of PFM. If you look at the bottom left of your screen, 
we're displaying information about um, budget preparation. It's the same case for budget execution, uh, accounting and reporting. They're all the same, they're all showing the same tendencies. On the other hand, we, there appears to be a lot of opportunities to strengthen PFM systems in, in the sub-Saharan African region, uh, and also in the South Asia region. It also appears that national governments typically outperform subnational governments when it comes to PFM. The second thing I would like to highlight is the um, is that the report highlights that countries are performing on some aspects of PFM better than others. And in this, this graph is showing that key areas where there is a tendency to, for countries to outperform on PFM include uh, the budget preparation process. And this also includes in-year resource allocations, in internal controls on non-salary expenditures, and debt management. Going even further, this slide basically indicates that countries are relatively strong at preparing multi-annual budgets. It also seems that budget documents are typically quite comprehensive uh, and that countries generally, have, generally handle important treasury functions well. For example, the recording, of, uh, recording and management of cash balances, debt guarantees, and so on. And it also seems that states are normally transparent with taxpayer information. For example, obligations and liability. In contrast, functions such as the management of fiscal risks, audit, both internal and external, and scrutiny by supreme audit institutions emerge as the weakest areas of PFM. Now, in our current, given our current context of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, this finding has several worrying implications. At the very least, it it, it the findings seem to suggest that many countries across the world may eventually struggle to properly execute billions of dollars of um, billions of dollars being programmed or borrowed to manage the COVID-19 situation. And in fact, to expedite funding, expedite spending, countries may end up circumventing standard accountability procedures, which may clearly lead to increased risk of corruption. Finally. The, the report looks at PFM trends across time. And what this shows, what the report shows is that countries are in general improving or strengthening their PFM systems over time, but there are several examples of regression. Looking ahead, it may be prudent for governments and the international, the international development community to identify and prioritize reform for these aspects of the PFM system that are most at risk of slipping backwards. And so this is so that the system may be able to better withstand or to hold steady while managing the fiscal stresses of COVID-19. Let me stop here and hand over to my colleague Ushka, who will walk you through the remaining three sections of the report. Many thanks for your attention. Uh, uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, so, in addition to the presentation of kind of global and regional PFM trends, um, this report also features a presentation of selected case studies. And why we've done this is to really kind of complement this high level overview of PFM trends with a more in depth analysis of PFM strengths and weaknesses at the country or territory level. And in this first edition of the report, we're presenting four case studies. We have Argentina. They recently had a first PIFA assessment, and this REACH PIFA assessment report highlights, for example, how incredibly comprehensive uh, budget documentation is in Argentina and the strong role that the legislature uh, plays in scrutinizing budget policy proposals. We're also featuring Ethiopia. They recently had a fourth PIFA assessment, but why we think they represent a really interesting case is that the assessment, PIFA assessment report, not only presents PFM strengths and weaknesses, but also how they potentially influence uh, service delivery um, uh, in the country. Then we have Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is the first country in the world that has had a successive PIFA assessment using the PIFA 2016 framework. But all in all, uh, this has been the fourth PIFA assessment in Ukraine 
so users can really see um, how incredibly uh, how incredible um, Ukraine has progressed in terms of uh, PFM um, uh, reforms, uh, specifically in areas of budget credibility, transparency of fi uh, public finances, um, as well as external scrutiny and audit. And then we also have West Bank and Gaza. They've had a, a third PIFA assessment, and we believe they provide quite a compelling case of uh, focusing on strengthening financial data integrity, um, as well as producing really comprehensive uh, budget execution uh, reports. Then we have another section uh, that presents kind of global trends in integrating gender in the design, implementation and evaluation of budget policies and why we have done that. So um, this section five um, in future iterations will always kind of focus on the links between PFM and broader uh, development outcomes, including linking it with sustainable development goals. But for this year, we decided to explore links between PFM and SDG5 on gender equality. Uh, we thought that would be quite a natural fit. Um, as many of you might know, last year, PIFA launched a PIFA uh, gender framework for assessing integration of gender in PFM. Uh, so we thought it would be important to kind of highlight um, findings of uh, initial PIFA gender assessments. And what we were able to determine from a relatively uh, small sample is that there's a growing emerging trend in a very systematic integration of gender in PFM in countries around the world. But while countries practices in doing so very considerably, we notice that there are two kind of most common uh, PFM tools that countries use uh, to do so. Um, they're producing gender budget statements, which is probably not a surprise. This is how equality budgeting started in Australia back in the 80s. But countries are also conducting ex post evaluations of budget policies to understand what the impacts of those policies um, have been um, on, on gender and on different segments of the society. But what, are we, what we're hoping that users will be particularly excited about this, um, this chapter is that we're presenting numerous, numerous case studies of countries' experience in integrating uh, gender in PFM by using a variety of different PFM tools, such as collection and analysis of sex disaggregated data, like in, like in Korea and in Ukraine, uh, producing uh, gender reports, as well as getting the legislature highly involved in the process, uh, like in Fiji. And then we have the last, the last section of the report, which is a section that we call a call to action. As you will see when browsing through the report, this is the first time that um, we are making PIFA panel data set publicly available. So users can go um, access the report, download the PIFA panel data, and really start playing and kind of playing with the data, augment it with other data sets, and do some exciting research on different aspects of PFM, as well as links with other uh, governance initiatives. You will see in the report, we're listing several ideas for further analysis um, that we find particularly important, but of course, um, users, um, PFM enthusiasts, PIFA users are encouraged to kind of think of other uh, potential areas for analysis and uh, as well as to kind of reach out to the secretariat and others uh, to share um, that um, the interesting findings. Um, so with this, we really want um, to invite everyone to explore the report, um, browse through over 100 interactive uh, visualizations um, and really have fun when exploring uh, global PFM trends. Uh, thank you, and, and back to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Pushka. At, at this point, let me take a, a minute or so to give you a live demonstration of the report. Um, so the, the, our plan is to release the report at the end of this launch, a series of launches. So we have four launches planned, and the report will be made publicly available on the P4 website uh, for download and access. In the meantime, there are four key features I'd like to point out for, for interactive features about the report I'd like to emphasize. The first is that 
all charts are interactive. So the charts are all here in section three. And they're all interactive. Uh, once you, they, can, they have these Hoover features, you can Hoover over them to see um, more, more details. Um, in this particular chart, you can see that the data is broken down by subnational and national levels. The second feature is that all charts and data are shareable by social media and so on. And so here, they all have this three pronged uh, icon. Once you click, you can share the report on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and by email. The third feature is that the, uh, uh, the, um, the report is downloadable. Down, down, you can download the report um, via PDF if, if you so desire. And finally, as Ushka mentioned, you can also download all data that uh, is used, that the report uses. Let me stop there and hand over back to our chair, who will take you forward with the rest of the session's proceedings. Thank you so much. And you are mute. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Oscar and uh, Richard. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, the idea for this report came from all of you, the practitioners. We have seen the analysis of data regionally and in sectors, picking from the PEFA reports. The demand for such analysis inspired the PEFA secretariat to put together this report. I thank all my colleagues on the PEFA steering committee for their support and inputs to this endeavor. Let me also take this opportunity to congratulate Oscar, Richard, and Sack, the core team who put together the report and the entire PEFA secretary. I also thank Joaquim Buena, um, Mark Miller, and Paolo De Rezio, uh, and all the peer reviewers who contributed comments and feedback at various stages of the reports. Development. I'm sure you would agree that the look and feel of the digital report is really very brilliant. I appreciate the excellent work done by Scheme Design, and I now hand over the proceedings to Nika to moderate the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ed, um, and uh, I join you in thanking uh, Ushka and uh, Richard for the presentation, and of course, uh, thanking every, everybody that has contributed to this report. Um, so, just like Ed introduced me, my name is Adeni Ke Uyiyola. I'm a practice manager in the Governance Global Practice, and um, I, have the, I have the honor of being in charge of the PIFA Secretariat, who have been the one um, doing this uh, very great work. So, and I'll be moderating the, the, this discussion this morning. The topic we're going to be discussing is our public financial management in the 21st century. Implications of the global reports for PFM policy, practice, and research. Uh, many, of, uh, many, uh, many of you would agree with me that the COVID-19 pandemic has destabilized the global economy. And it has shown how effective and strong governance is pertinent. There are concerns, um, uh, I mean, many quarters on how government would handle the challenges that uh, the pandemic has brought up about, not only in the short term, but also in the medium and in the long term. So it's um, a big honor to have uh, a panel of uh, very high level PFM. Um, practitioners to be discussing this topic today. Uh, the panel will be focusing on four areas. The first, we're going to share different perspectives on what we know, uh, I mean, on what the panel knew about present and emerging PFM issues in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, secondly, uh, the panel will discuss areas of potential opportunities to strengthen PFM going ahead. So looking forward. Um, thirdly, uh, we'll, uh, the panel again will look at some specific examples of measures being taken in different countries and um, in order to explore such opportunities. 
And uh, lastly, we would be answering questions uh, about the PFM in the 21st century. So, I mean, I'll have the responsibility of directing the, uh, the, uh, the, the process of the panel. Uh, we have, let me see, uh, just about one hour or less to go through this panel discussion. So, we're going to try and keep it very smart uh, uh, in what we are saying. Um, I'm going to break the discussion into two. The first is to hear from our panelists, the three people that has uh, kindly agreed to join us and give their perspectives today. And the second part will be an open discussion. So please, there's a chat button, put in your uh, questions, put in your uh, comments, and we will try as much as possible to cover many of the chats during the uh, discussion. So now let me go ahead and uh, uh, introduce our three panelists today. Like Ed said, these are practitioners, very strong practitioners in public financial management. So, and it's our honor to have them um, participate in this event. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Sailendra Ratanayak. Sailendra is a Deputy Chair, Division Chief in the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF. Um, of course, is a well-known global expert on public financial management. Um, Sailendra, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, secondly, um, I have uh, Fred Sinyamba. Mr. Yamba is the Secretary to the Treasury at the Ministry of Finance in Zambia. He brings decades of experience in public financial management from a developing country perspective, which has success successfully used uh, the paper assessment to navigate PFM reforms. And last, but definitely not the least, I have Dr. Joachim Wena. Uh, Joachim is an Associate Professor of Public Policy at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He's worked extensively on public finance uh, in Canada, in Germany, in South Africa, and in the United Kingdom and all with the aim of improving the use of public funds. So, um, Salendra, Fredsin, uh, Joachim, you are all welcome today, and thanks for joining us in this uh, very uh, interesting panel discussion. So, I'll be asking each panelist um, two questions, one after the other, and right after that, we'll then open it up to the uh, audience. So, Salendra, let me start with you. Um, so my first question is a very fundamental one. And so the question is, what do you, uh, do you think PFM systems are delivering the needed flexibility to optimize development outcomes at sector level? So I want you to look at sector level and see how PFM systems are delivering the needed flexibility. Sailendra, over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the World Bank Group to Giving, for giving me this honor to come to this panel. So let me, um, uh, this is an interesting question which you asked, um, but before I go into some of the details, let me discuss this issue by linking it to the main objectives of a strong PFM framework. Uh, as you know, there are four key goals um, of a strong PFM system, overall sustainability of public finances, efficient allocation of resources, in line with government priorities, efficient public service delivery, and transparency and accountability in managing public funds. Therefore, to achieve optimal outcomes, whether it is in sector or otherwise, the PFM system should be able to effectively allocate to and execute priority development programs, at the same time ensuring overall fiscal sustainability and transparency. So just to give that context, now, as I was listening to the PIFA presentation yeah. results, countries have been strengthening their PFM systems over the years. But my experience shows that uh, we still see gaps in several countries. Um, from the perspective of the question you asked, I would highlight, for example, the lack of a comprehensive view of public finances, Limitation in budget flexibility, because you mentioned budget flexibility, due to extensive budget rigidities we see in some countries, for example, your marking of revenues, and lack of a medium-term focus in some countries also, 
to identify the fiscal space for private spending in various sectors. This pandemic has actually further ac accentuated, I would say, the need for more flexible and agile budgets, as the ministries of finance are even further strain, under strain to respond timely to this crisis. So let me mention five key areas or gaps that should be the focus of strengthening PFM systems to help optimize development outcomes at sector level. First, I think we, do, we it's needless to overemphasize that first establish strong institutional coordination with clear roles of key PFM actors. The Minister of Finance, for example, needs to effectively coordinate the budget process, giving guidance to the line ministries or sector ministries and scrutinizing sector priorities, regardless of the type of budget process, whether it's top down or bottom up, clear political guidance and consensus is very important at the outset to set the overarching goals of public spending and sectoral priorities. This means a prominent role for the cabinet in conjunction with the Minister of Finance, and which also should provide information. Otherwise, the sector ministries may play games in terms of the information information advantage they have to further their own interests. So that is the first thing I'd like to highlight. Second, it's also very important to clarify the overall fiscal constraint with a medium term perspective. Nearly all countries now face significant constraints on their public finances and more exposure to fiscal risks in the wake of the recent pandemic. Now, in close coordination with entities that are in charge of finding government's financing, for example, debt management or other, other institutions, there is a need to study the possible financing options to assess the overall fiscal constraint and set up the overall fiscal strategy and sector strategies. This is where I think the medium term perspective is very useful to lock in future savings and reverse the impact of any temporary or one of measures that have been taken and that needs to be wound down in future years. On sectors, I think it's also very important third point I want to make, clearly identify the priority sectors. More limited resources and the need to ensure sustainable spending calls for a greater focus on strategic sectors. For example, health, social spending, water, support for economic recovery, et cetera, as identified, of course, by the authorities. In countries where these priority sectors are mostly dealt with by subnational governments, it's also important to give subnational governments a clear picture of the financing constraints and the macroeconomic scenarios that might impact their revenue. Fourth, ensure credible budget execution and predictability of funding. Our experience shows that good planning and budgeting is not enough unless we have a strong budget execution system to implement the budget as planned and approved. The gap between upstream and downstream of the budget cycle affects predictability of funding to various sectoral programs and projects. Fourth, it's important, it's going to be even more important in the course of the recovery from the pandemic, manage the investment projects portfolio very prudently in various sectors. For various reasons, as we know, countries keep more projects alive than that are, than are financially sustainable and try to stretch payments over a longer period. Such decisions reduce the net benefits of the investment portfolio. When cuts in investment spending are unavoidable, they should be based on transparent criteria and not across the board to minimize their negative impact. Cuts should target investment projects with lower benefits compared to costs, and the impact of the cuts on different groups or sectors of the economy should be consistent with established political priorities. So I think if uh, countries take these five key steps, they should, I think, be able to leverage the PFM systems to optimize development outcomes at sector level. So I would stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much. I mean, um, I, I really like the way you put the five core aspects forward. And um, I believe uh, colleagues who are uh, joining this um, important uh, discussion are really taking this core aspect. Please, again, let me emphasize, start putting your um, questions in the chat and we'll come back to it. So, uh, Salendra, you mentioned these very five core areas and I totally agree with you. 
But as development partners, uh, we would always encourage countries to build strong PFM foundations to support resilient recovery. But in, in addition to that, we will also we will also encourage countries to prioritize um, their reform um, process. I mean, it's becoming a cliche prioritization, which is very important, given um, the funding issues and uh, so many things that needs to be done. But my challenge is um, there does not seem to be a workable approach towards this prioritization. So how do you see this uh, storyline emerging, given the, the crisis we have now, I mean, uh, and the way going forward? So uh, how do you see this uh, storyline of uh, prioritizing or whatever going forward? Over to you, Salendra. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, again. I think this is a very important point, and you were right. Reform prioritization has been emphasized for decades, but uh, has proven challenging to apply in practice. Uh, I think it is important to recognize that one size fits all type of PFM reform prioritization doesn't work. Um, there are several examples uh, we have heard of reform failures in several PFM areas, uh, and uh, these PFM reform failures have multiple causes which should be analyzed and factored in for developing an appropriate uh, prioritization strategy. Let me give some examples. Um, many a times people in charge of PFM reforms or technical assistance providers tend to focus on the technical aspects and not so much on the institutional and political economy aspects of reform. For example, while a flawed technical design of a treasury single account system or a financial management information system like IPMIS might have been addressed. There may be lack of ownership or opposition from powerful stakeholders to implement them. Similarly, while the design of the PFM legal framework may be adequate, but its enforcement might be weak. So, and also I may add to that, it is also not uncommon to see a lengthy list of actions and over ambitious timelines in the so-called prioritized reform action plans the time periods for implementing PFM reforms are frequently underestimated. So what could we do to, for reform prioritization to work in practice then? The first step, I think, is to internalize the valuable lessons learned in PFM-related political economy and change management issues in particular. For reforms to succeed, both types of challenges, technical and institutional and political, need to be addressed. Again, let me also highlight uh, maybe five important factors to keep in mind for ensuring reform success to build strong PFM foundations. First, recognize the usefulness, but also the limitations of PFM diagnostic tools. Diagnostic tools are very useful for making the overall evaluation of PFM strengths and weaknesses to identify the gaps, but they may not give sufficient information how reforms should be implemented which weak areas PFMs should be addressed first. For example, the sequencing question, what is the extent of institutional constraints, particularly on political economy side, and how these might be overcome? Second, try to up customize or tailor the PFM system technical design, not to go with a one size fits all, to align with stakeholders' roles and priorities in, in countries. This actually requests with a broad consultation with the relevant stakeholders. Third, try to build progressively political support for the reform measures. This is where I think focusing initially on low hanging fruit or quick pins help to build support and push for harder decisions later and mitigate resistance from strong and powerful actors. Fourth, Sequence the reform measures taking account of the stakeholders landscape. It's very important to understand the stakeholders landscape in specific countries to strategically target the reform to the right stakeholders at the right time. Uh, finally, this is more for the technical assistance providers, identify and support a key local counterpart to help steer the reform or to act as the reform champion and take credit for it. Now, coming to the pandemic world, the PFM reform prioritization is even more important in the post-COVID-19 world. Now, again, to give some examples, governments are using a range of support measures now to address the macroeconomic and social challenges 
posed by the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, support measures are taking various types, you know, and some of them are resulting in higher fiscal deficits. Some of them may not be impacting deficits in this year, but they will uh, affect the public finances in the, over the medium term going forward, particularly the off-budget or below the line operations. So this uh, highlights that strong, the, the lot of fiscal risks governments are undertaking. And strong fiscal systems are ne needed to guard against these fiscal risks and enhance the government's capacity to respond to the crisis and manage these fiscal risks. As the lockdown ends, the governments are also going to begin to focus on the recovery side as well. And the public investments are going to play an important role in the recovery. But institutional arrangements for taking decisions on the selection and management of investment projects would be key in this area. And this would include, this would include all key stakeholders in central government, SNGs, and uh, public operations where these sectors make substantial contributions to public investment. Overall, just to summarize, the post-pandemic world has brought up for the importance of prioritizing PFM foundations in some emerging areas, I would say managing fiscal risks and public investments, while the need for strengthening core PFM areas still remain continuous. So I would stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sailendra. I, I, I know this is a very passionate topic for you, so and I know you can go on and on. But I mean, I really take your point. Um, diagnosis, diagnostics are very important. And what we always um, always emphasize is the need for political will and the country buy-in. I mean, once we have a country buy-in, then they can be able to translate it into reforms and sequence the reforms. So now let, let's look at the country experience, core country experience. So I'd like to go to Mr. Yamba. And if you don't mind, I'll call you Fred Sin. I hope that's okay with you. So, uh, Mr. Yamba, um, you saw the presentation by uh, the, the PEFA colleagues, uh, Pat, um, and one of the things that came out is the fact that budget looks great, but execution is a challenge. In the same way, there are several reforms that looks good on paper to start, but may, may not have tangible results in the countries. So looking ahead, how do you think we can fix this core situation? Yeah, um, Fredson? Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Well, with regard to that, I, as you are aware, the PFM reforms are aimed at improving, first of all, accountability and transparency in the use of public resources. And the reforms, in most cases, are dynamic. Now, if you look at the past last 20 years, many countries, many developing countries embarked on PFM reforms that were part of the IMF structure adjustment program, that's the SAPS. The scope of these reforms was quite comprehensive, standard, and covered all areas of the PFM cycle. Uh, beyond the structure adjustment programs, many countries have continued to implement the PFM reforms to address areas of weaknesses in the budget cycle. In terms of design, the scope of the reforms are usually solid as there are clear development objectives, output indicators, and output outcomes, including the reform activities required to achieve the set objectives. However, the outcomes of these reforms have been quite mixed, I should mention. And in case of Zambia, the government has been implementing PFM reforms for more than 20 years and has made progress in the areas of the PFM legal reforms, planning and budgeting processes, public procurement, financial accounting and reporting, internal audit, external audit, and parliamentary oversight. However, I must mention a lot more needs to be done, such as expanding the IPMIS and Treasury single account coverage to the districts, as well as that of electronic government procurement system, and also enhancing debt management system and continuous training of staff, just to mention some. The challenges that we have faced in implementing these reforms include, but not limited to the following. One, lack of staff capacity involved in implementing reform projects and transfer of skills. Secondly, resistance to change and staff turnover. 
vaguely procurement delays, poor lack of resources to implement the reforms, and fifth, poor contract management, which has resulted in delayed execution of projects. To address these challenges and ensure that the reforms are achieving the desired outcomes, there is need to ensure that the staff involved in project implementation have the capacity to execute the functions. Further, procurement processes need to be rationalized to ensure efficiency. In addition, there is also need to ensure that capacity is built for staff involved in contract management. Uh, the government has also put in place the PFM laws, such as the Public Finance Management Act of 2008, and also the Public Procurement Act of 2020, with specific provisions for offenses and penalties against staff failing to discharge their functions, which consequently result in wastage of public resources. I should mention that the government has also consistently, consistently undertaken public expenditure and financial accountability assessments to determine the level of progress made in the implementation of the PFM reforms as well as identified areas of weaknesses in the budget cycle that require reform interventions. We will, be, we will continue to use PEPFA and various diagnostic assessments to inform our PFM reforms, and we remain on track to accelerate the positive impacts of the reforms. This will ensure that the reform areas are identified in a structured manner, and hence the reforms are country-specific and country-driven. Uh, the government also consider that, considers that the next step in this evolution process is strengthening of PFM at sectoral level and linking PFM improvements with service delivery results in core areas such as health, education, and local government services. The government has also already started taking steps to strengthen PFM of local governments and currently we are working together with the World Bank to strengthen the PFM and accountability in the health sector, which is quite timely in view of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our, moreover, benchmarking performance against similar countries, as well as sharing PFM reforms experiences, is something to be considered. For the government of Zambia, we've done study tours that have been undertaken to other countries, such as Ghana, and Mauritius, and we've been able to share lessons and experiences. With regard, as the global report now is being launched today by the PEPFA Secretariat, I think this is a major step that will be useful in many countries. While country context is very important for PFM reforms, the trend on the progress of the global and regional level will give us a broad direction of where we need to aspire to be. So going forward, I would also encourage the PEPFA team to further unpack the reasons behind the successes and limitations in progress at global and regional level. From Zambia, we are glad to support the global initiative of PEPFA, Secretariat and Development Partners by sharing our views and experience. That will be my submission. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I mean, this, it's so nice to really know what's going on uh, in, in Zambia. This is really good. So substantial investments would have been made uh, with, res with respect to everything you have said, um, all in an attempt to strengthen these PFM information systems. So my question would be, from your perspective, is the government of Zambia getting value for money for these investments? And I wanted to expand the term government to also include the citizens. Are they getting value for money? You can, I mean, speak from the perspective of Zambia, which you are leading, but probably from the perspective of other countries. And I mean, closely related to that, how do you think the role of PFM technology, I mean, such as if means, if procurement, um, cloud-based systems will emerge in the post-COVID-19 world? Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what I should mention is that uh, indeed across the world, uh, governments have made substantial investments in the PFM information systems in order to enhance accountability and transparency in the use of public resources. 
Here again, I must mention that the features mix on whether governments are getting value for money for their investments in the PFM information systems. Now to zero down in case of Zambia, in the last 20 years, government has invested in excess of $100 million US dollars on the PFM reforms. We are beginning to realize slowly that the value of this investment over the last, we are beginning to realize the value of this investment over the last uh, uh, couple of years. And what we've noticed is that on the la in the last five years, revenue general revenue collection has greatly improved because of the tf reforms that we've undertaken i can mention that domestic revenue has increased on average year to year at a rate of 17 percent from 2015 to 2018 and in fact has exceeded the targets another positive result is the reduction in financial management if you look at the audit general's report in Zambia, this indicated reduction of 79%, that is up from 43.5 million US dollars in 2015 to 18.5 million US dollars in 2017 in the value of financial mismanagement. Now, this is a big reduction. This is also at the time the audit coverage for the Office of Auditor General is now almost 100 percent i must mention that the office of the auditor general structures and staffing have been expanded and there's now a presence in all the 10 provinces of zambia either the office has now demanded to audit all 116 local governments now during the year 2020 the office was able to audit the financial management of all the 116 local government authorities for the financial year ended the 1st December 2018 and 2019. Now, with regard to the role of how the public financial management technology will emerge post the COVID-19 world, the future looks bright. In the case of Zambia, the government has embarked on an ambitious IT transformation agenda, which was launched by the president in 2019. And the objective of this reform is to digitize more than 200 public services, including revenue collections from payments for government services. In total, the plan is to digitize more than 216 public services through the implementation of the government service pass and payment gateway. This will enhance accountability and transparency, efficiency, and security by utilizing IT solutions such as mobile payments and electronic payments. The advantages of the IT solutions is less human contact, thus reducing the potential for corruption and also transmission of the COVID-19 pandemic. Further, the misappropriation of revenue is equally eliminated to date the government of Zambia has implemented 52 electronic services on the government service bus, and these are accessible on the ZAM port to the members of the public seeking various services from the government. The government service bus is also interfaced with the IFMIS to ensure seamless interchange of data between all government systems connected to the bus. Going forward, it is government's intention to build an end-to-end -end digital ecosystem for the whole government. The government has also implemented the Treasury Single Account, which has improved cash management and efficiency in the processing of payments. The TSA, I must mention, has ensured effective aggregate control of government cash resources. Because the consolidation of cash resources through the TSA is actually meant to optimize government cash management to avoid short term borrowing and associated costs to finance the expenditure of some government agencies, while other agencies keep idle cash balances in their bank accounts. Uh, with regard to the risk in the major IT projects on the PFM, is the broad scope of such projects. They are most successful when we align functionality of the IT system 
with the problem definition. I think the first steps are the most important one as they set out the direction. This implies that all teams involved from government and beyond should be focused on the problem statement as viewed from the government. In Zambia, at various points of time, we periodically revise and we focus on the short and medium term issues that government is likely to face and leverage on technology solutions like ICMIS, government uh, service bus, etc. Et uh, with regard to the paper assessment, this has helped us to ensure we are aligned with the global based practices to national requirements. And that's my submission. On that <laughs> Thank, thank you very much. And I know we can go on and on uh, listening to the very good work that is going on in Zambia. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very helpful. So um, I see we're having a very active uh, chat, quite a lot of activities. Please, thanks very much for that. Let it keep coming. Let it keep coming. We'll come to your questions very soon. So I'd like to turn it to, other, to the academics. Let's look at uh, this from the perspective of the academic world. Um, and uh, Joachim is here to help me in that regard. So Joachim, uh, uh, relocating budgets to health sectors and launching ambitious stimulus plans are some of the fiscal measures being undertaken um, to counter the COVID-19 pandemic health crisis. But these drastic actions can pose significant uh, transparency challenges. I, I mean, as you and I know, uh, issues on accountability, issues on transparency. So how can increased uh, budgetary disclosure and participation, improve governance and development out outcomes during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. So Joachim, over to you. Thank you very much uh, for, for your questions. And also, let me just say thank you for inviting me to be part of this event together with two practitioners who have such impressive experience and I really support the idea behind this report. I think it's a really good initiative that we harness the data to try to understand better uh, how to and, 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 and try to understand how to improve public financial management. So thank you for that. And I'm very supportive of that. To your question, my fear is that this pandemic will expose some longstanding weaknesses that your reports and your findings uh, have captured in oversight and accountability institutions. And that would partly inform my comments in terms of where I would see uh, the key areas that we might want to focus on in order to, to change that and to make sure that that money spent actually does something on the ground. So I think uh, spending without accountability and over oversight spending without a modicum, some basic level of checks and balances will be bad expenditure. And unfortunately, in an emergency situation, you have a lot of very quickly, where very often checks and balances are, are suspended. And that is really visible throughout the, the budget cycle. Uh, it starts with very weak legislative control at the start of the budget process during budget approval in the legislature. So in many countries, and here I include the United Kingdom, which is uh, not doing well in, in this regard, I, I believe the level at which Parliament oversees public finances is very, very high. So spending gets approved very often at a departmental level and parliaments don't pay or don't have enough control over what goes on inside departmental budgets. And I take very well the point uh, that Salendra uh, made early on about the need for flexibility. I, I, I agree very much with that, but there's some kind of balance that needs to be struck between flexibility on the one hand, giving the space to be nimble, but at the same time having a sensible level Many countries, uh, including my, my country, uh, the level of oversight is extremely aggregate and that comes to the fore in a crisis like this, where you have a lot of reallocations and, and transfers between different items, items in the budget that get made. And that speaks to my second point I would make here, that a second weakness then is during the 
execution stage of the budget process, where for many years now, we do know that legislatures in particular do not pay enough attention to that. Legislatures kind of have their prime moment, budget day and the finance minister comes, the chancellor comes to the parliament and there's a, there's a lot of media attention. And then the spotlight disappears and the nitty gritty, the daily grind of having a look at actual expenditure during the financial year, that is one of the weak areas in oversight uh, in really almost all countries. Um, and I think this is especially crucial, of course, in, 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 in the context of a pandemic where you have so much emergency expenditure, where things change so quickly, you really need strong in-year oversight institutions, which I feel into this crisis where we're very underdeveloped in many places. Uh, so, in addition to that, the oversight of tools such as contingency reserves and so on deserve real attention in, in crisis situations. And these are sensible tools to have, um, and they allow quick responses by governments, but they need to be also underpinned by a real-time reporting in particular to to legislatures. Um, so I think the approval and budget oversight during execution, there's a key question mark here over how can we make legislatures play a stronger role in the process? And that is partly about rethinking the institutions that enable that. But one of the key obstacles often is you know, why, why are these institutions weak in the first place? And that very often has to do with MPs, parliamentarians, not having an oversight role in the first place. So it's one thing to, to say these institutions should change in that way or that way, but uh, why, why isn't that happening by itself? It very often has to do with insufficient incentives of, of parliamentarians. And then your report also highlighted that um, a key weakness has been on the audit side. Um, so there has been a lot of hard work going into strengthening supreme audit institutions. And I think in many ways, they will be the ones picking up <laughs> uh, at, after all the spending has, has taken place, they will be picking up the pieces and investigating what went wrong. And many of them have responded in, in very, um, creative ways. They're issuing special reports. For example, the Auditor General in South Africa is issuing special reports on COVID-related expenditure here in the UK. That's the case in many other countries. Auditors are doing, uh, they're trying to do a lot to keep an eye on spending that is uh, taking place in the context of, of the pandemic. But if you, um, I'm, I was glad to hear there has been investment, for example, in, in Zambia, in strengthening the, the staffing and the capacity of the Auditor General, but we know from, from the PIFA reports that this remains a core weakness. So I think oversight and accountability institutions, both the legislature and uh, and, and strengthening. Let me maybe mention one last point that perhaps this crisis is crystallizing that a, a lot of spending measures have been undertaken on an emergency basis in, in this crisis, and that means weaker control and weaker oversight. And maybe that will need some special attention because it, it, it is taking place on a scale that is very, very large. Uh, you know, emergencies like a little flood or, <laughs> uh, or an earthquake, uh, of course, they can be very large emergencies as well. But what we're seeing at the moment is, is a, in many countries out of, out of all proportions. And that really should prompt us to rethink the transparency of our emergency expenditure and procurement provisions. So this I see as a, as a, as a separate area where I would say we need to maybe pay, pay attention and learn the lessons from what, what's going on and uh, what's going wrong at the moment with some of the spending and how can we strengthen these institutions so that the spending is better used and put to better better use in, in the future. Thanks very much, uh, um, Joachim. That, that's really, really helpful. I mean, transparency and, and accountability has always been core issues that I believe uh, we need to take a closer look at. So in another two minutes, I want to start, uh, turn to the public, but I wanted to quickly 
um, give me some points. Um, two core things we are doing at the PIFA Secretariat now. One is on research, or coming up with various topics and doing some good research uh, on it uh, also, uh, for the benefits of the PFM uh, in the larger scale. You also notice that the global report featured uh, gender this time. The intention is to global, uh, mm -hmm. feature different aspects in, in the annual report. So from your perspectives, what are the critical PFM areas where future research is needed and where the uh, global reports could contribute in the future? In one or two minutes. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Uh, let me be quick. So I think PIFA has done well in recent years to start to focus on uh, subnational governments, and that partly acknowledges that even inside countries, we have a lot of variation. And I think one step further along this path, broadly speaking, would be to think more about sector uh, spending sectors and, and big spending ministries. So how can we use the PIFA framework to think about what goes on in partic particularly important sectors? Uh, because um, some of the underlying problems, even within the same country and the same governments that drive the quality of public spending are very, very different. So how, how can we harness this tool to think about this in a more sector specific way? That would be one challenge I would throw maybe to you. And then let me just make one, one very quick comment. One thing that very often strikes me is that we talk a lot of, a lot about institutions, um, and understand why this is the case, but I, I think we also need to uh, pay attention to the people that run these institutions. And I'm often struck by, uh, you know, a lot of the challenges that are faced in, in public sectors around the world in terms of understaffing, in terms of uh, uh, key staff not having the requisite qualifications, etc. So this, this kind of, how do we think about performance in government by maybe bringing in also the people and understanding who runs these institutions, not solely focusing on the institutions and, and procedures per se. So that's a second point I would make. Hey, thanks so much. Um, I mean, everybody will agree with me. This has been a very good uh, conversation. Don't go away, panelists. There are questions coming to you because I'm seeing some very good and very interesting questions on the chat. I will take some of it. Um, I know my colleague Tia has been helping me to uh, put together the questions and I'll call on her very soon. I noticed that some of these questions are already answered um, either uh, from the panel discussion or um, some of my colleagues have been answering as well. But uh, Tia, any hot thing from your side? Um, could you give me some questions uh, that we can take for now? Absolutely. Thank you, Nike, and thank you, everybody, for your questions uh, and comments. Very, very helpful and useful. I just wanted to clarify first the one question being coming to us um, in terms of getting access to the report. Just to say that report will be launched officially a bit later, but we will post you a link to the report that you can have a look at in the chat later. Just to clarify that first. And then there's a second, uh, well, the first um, set of questions rather that are due with the report itself or, or PIFA, PIFA framework. And that one set of questions is about comparison between countries, as we know, it's always difficult to do. And the questions concern whether the global report plays caveats on comparisons between countries. And the second related question is, is that all countries mentioned as best practice countries are rife with corruption and financial indiscipline. How can BFM in these countries be cited, cited as model systems? And that is a sort of maybe for um, be for colleague, colleagues um, to clarify. But the second sec set of questions is is more for the panelists, and that is to do with prioritization, as the panelists have already been discussing. There are questions that come in through the chat about what are the key aspects in your perspective in the in the pfm system that we should really try to prioritize particularly in the context of the of the current crisis how should um pfm experts and countries um trying to put covid um crisis in the context 
and um, differentiate and prioritize different elements. Um, and is it too early to say whether uh, progress on BFM, BFM has deteriorated during the current crisis? Do we need, know yet for sure what has happened and what hasn't happened? Um, I will leave it there. There are much further questions on uh, sector specific on climate change issues, but maybe I'll leave it there and, and Nikkei and come back to the second, uh, third set of questions later. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Tia. Uh, let me just, uh, before I go to, the, to answering the question, uh, Salendra, uh, get ready. I'm going to throw that at you and uh, probably Joachim to also support. Um, I see comments on uh, interest in linking with the PIFA secretariat uh, from the Southern African, uh, I think, PFM body. So please uh, get in touch with uh, PIFA secretariat. It's PIFA.org. Uh, get in touch with them and they'll be happy to support you. Salendra, so what's your perspective? Um, what is the PFM to prioritize? I know you mentioned that. In your first uh, point, you talked about the five uh, core ways or areas, but uh, if you can just mention one, two uh, in one minute. Over to you, Salendra. Thank you. Um, I think on prioritization in the uh, post pandemic, one of the area to focus on would be uh, to get a tech stock of the uh, fiscal risks, which countries have uh, already undertaken because. Many of the fiscal support measures uh, that have been uh, taken by the governments are not necessarily reflected in the budget. Some of them have uh, been off budget, some of them have been in the form of guarantees or other types of below the line support, as we call them. And uh, the, the, their impact would come in future budgets. So it's important to assess uh, the implications of those measures and be prepared how to, you know, uh, how to address them. I mean, some of them might have to be burned by the governments if the risks are high or some of the uh, you know state-owned enterprises who have received guarantees if those guarantees are called for example this is very important so i would stop there maybe that's one key area to go for so thank you very much that's that's very helpful i see a question on the chat um, it says what is the link between pfm and service delivery um, to me it looks like the person asking the question has answered but um, I would like to call on the head of PIFA Secretariat, uh, Shrini, Shrini um, who was actually, I mean, who wears a double hat, very experienced in PFM and service delivery to probably in one minute to uh, Shrini, talk about PFM and service delivery. Shrini. Thank you very much, Nikke. Thank you very much, Nikke. And uh, great to see all the chats uh, coming up quickly on the service delivery issues. So there is this clear disconnect one sees globally on the PFM systems created at central level, typically led by ministries of finance and the demands for from the sector, particularly if from health, education. How does the, P does the PFM system work as an enabler for more efficient service delivery, which is one of the key budgetary outcomes, or is it a bottleneck? So there is a lot of effort going on across the world uh, amongst partners on figuring it, figuring, figuring out what are the issues bot, which are becoming bottlenecks for getting the right kind of a flexibility and timing for the funds and also the accountability uh, relating to that. One quick thought I can actually also leave is that recently the World Bank team released a, a new tool called FinHealth. So this is a kind of an bottleneck, bottom-up, bottleneck approach to overcoming PFM uh, so, uh, problems from a health sector perspective. And that's actually a, a trend which is spreading across various development partners who are trying to look at it from that perspective. Within the PFA Secretariat, we are taking these exper experiences and trying to position going forward the PFA tool as a stronger enabler towards service delivery in sectors. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Srini. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I have another question, and Tia, I'll come to you. <laughs> I mean, if you have uh, questions, just let me know. Uh, it says climate change has become a bigger issue vis-a-vis -vis the fiscal sustainability. Are you considering such changes to PIFA framework in line with the SDG or gender-related budget? This is interesting to me because I know we are <laughs> we're working on climate 
change our PFM in the FIFA Secretariat. So, Shrini or someone in the FIFA Secretariat, again, in very briefly, do you want to speak to that? Thanks, Nikkei. So, uh, quickly, on the climate change related issue, eventually, uh, any dimension of PFM event has to be within the overall country's national PFM system. So, recognizing this, so within the FIFA Secretariat, we uh, created this supplementary tool on uh, having a kind of a uh, climate responsiveness in public financial management systems and understanding understand how well they are aligned within the overall structure. So this tool is now being piloted across several countries, and we hope that these experiences of pilot will enable us to finalize the tool and release. It's also put as a part of the finance minister's um, uh, uh, platform of various countries on having climate responsiveness into the overall uh, budget process. This is work in progress and one of the most interesting areas uh, uh, that is emerging and we look forward to collaborating with anyone interested in this. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Srini. So, um, I would like to uh, uh, point, uh, point these questions to uh, Richard and or Oshka. Uh, so, it says, uh, does the report provide evidence that progress on PFM reform has deteriorated during COVID-19, or is it too early to say? Uh, so, anyone wants to uh, take that? Thank you very much, Nike. Uh, the very short answer to the question is no, not at this point. We do intend, though, to look at it once we are looking at future iterations of the report. It's important to recognize, though, that COVID-19 not only impacted PFM in general, but also PIFA and the data that we have access to. So um, the analysis will be a little tricky, but we will do our very best to look at the extent to which disasters such as COVID-19 have impacted the PFM systems globally, and we'll potentially look at this in future iterations of the report. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, um, thanks very much. So there's a question from Agnes, um, and uh, I'm going to respond to that myself. Uh, she says, uh, we have indeed achieved progress in terms of assessing gender responsiveness of PFM system. I'd like to know if there are plans to link the PFA indicators to other social development outcomes, uh, sustainable development goals, such as health and education. Linking PFM to service delivery would help maximize the use of PFA for better policy making. So um, just a very brief response to that. There's a lot of work we're doing uh, currently um, trying and doing in the PIFA Secretariat. Um, you know, uh, focus on service delivery is one aspect that uh, is of interest to us. Um, but what I'm going to suggest to Agnes, to every other person um, online is that if you have suggestions, um, we have, um, a place on, on the PEFA website where you can put your suggestions. So we're looking, we're, we're doing research, I mean, updating global reports annually. So you can come up with suggestions on areas that you think uh, should be focused on. So um, thanks for that, a very important question. And we would usually say that PFM is not just for PFM, it's for the purpose of being able to implement some things, which includes us uh, in service delivery. So, Tia, any, que any question on your side? Thank you, Nikkei. We also have a couple of questions around the broader context for PFM reforms. Uh, for example, um, our final panelist comments on looking beyond institution to focusing on individuals, their capacity, focusing on what's possible and looking for champions is critical. Is there any thinking to focus on tackling this important angle of reform and the broader civil service reform agenda to facilitate many key PFM reforms? Okay, who, who, who would like to take that of our three guests? <laughs> Joachim, do you want to take a stab at that? Otherwise, anyone in the professor can direct on you. I can just offer a few observations in, re in response to that. As, so, I think uh, on the one hand, institutions are 
strengthened by people who choose to strengthen them. And, you know, that depends a lot on who is the leader of, of, of a government, for example, and does that person have an interest in making stronger institutions? So uh, that is such a big political issue. But the one, um, the one area where I've very directly uh, encountered this for a number of years was trying to strengthen legislatures in terms of their budgetary role. I often go in front of parliamentary committees and periodically they have inquiries into how can we strengthen the budget process in the parliament. And it, it kind of feels to me I'm bringing the same presentation every time. And that tells me something about uh, that is something uh, kind of the underlying incentives for change and that they're sadly uh, often lacking. Uh, so I don't I don't have a, a, a brilliant answer to this, but other than just be opportunistic when you when you see that hunger for change and someone is really asking that question, go for it Then throw everything at supporting that that initiative. But trying to stimulate something where there is no demand is, is a very futile kind of enterprise. That's very good enough. Thanks very much. But, uh, I have this uh, last question for you, colleagues. Um, we have just six minutes remaining. Very great questions and uh, I'm, I'm very glad uh, we have so much interest in this regard. Um, there are three other launches, launches that is going to take place and we have opportunity to ask more questions. But this is for you, Joachim. So the question says, um, under the state of emergency situations where legislative power is suspended, what is the best way to ensure accountability in the use of public funds? And you may link it to what you said when you were discussing about you know, focusing on individuals, uh, individuals' capacity, and probably even the citizens. Uh, I mean, so would you want to take a step by that? <laughs> oh, that, that's such a tricky one. Maybe some, some of the other colleagues can, can comment on that, but I'm just aware that even in the OECD, you know, some governments have had months or, or many weeks in states of emergency, and these are very often situations where spending is authorized on a very different basis than along the normal process. Uh, so I, I think we need some kind of radical transparency that would underpin that. On the one hand, there's clearly a need to be quick and not, not to be encumbered by uh, rules that slow you down in a crisis response. But for example, if, if you award a contract outside normal procurement procedures, that is very large. Maybe, maybe the public accounts committee should know immediately, or maybe you know there should be very strict publication requirements, which in many instances, even in my own own country, uh, uh, have not always been adhered to in the in the past few months here. So, um, sorry, no, <laughs> no grand answer, but my my hunch is that the key there is in transparency. The response transparency. Thank you very much, um, and that's very helpful, uh, colleagues. Um, unfortunately, that's all uh, I can take uh, um, on the chat. Uh, great questions, great suggestions as well. Um, I see suggestions from Anju on uh, on debt and debt sustainability, and how PEFA can help to strengthen the asset management. Well taken. Um, I also see a very good comment uh, from um, Gregory on, on uh, assessing the impact of the political cycle on the progress or regression of PFM reforms. Well taken. Other very good comments, but um, of course, uh, because of time, I may not be able to take them again. But um, I think it's just a good sign to start uh, saying my thank you. But um, my core takeaway, I can't uh, sort of uh, summarize all, all the good things we've said um, at this discussion today, but uh, I think just a few things that still uh, sticks with me. Um, one is that uh, there's need for budget credibility. PFM reforms are pertinent. Um, diagnostics are important, but I mean, there's need to translate them to prioritize and actionable reform processes. Um, in order to have a very good reform and to tackle the challenges with this COVID-19 pandemic and other pandemic or other situations that we may um, encounter, there is need for a strong political win, 
will, there is need for government uh, buy-in. It's also necessary to align IT systems with the problem definition. I got that very strongly from, uh, from Zambia and I'm holding on to that. So it's not just IT for the sake of IT, we need to align it uh, with the uh, problem definition. And when it comes to transparency and accountabil accountability, the government just have to go full length. Judge, that's coming from you, and it has to be at all levels, at the national, at the subnational, and at the departmental level. Um, so, uh, Surendra, thanks for the five ways, five ways that you gave us. I think it's been very helpful for everybody here today. So, um, uh, I think it's a very good time to say a very big thank you to three people who, are, who I now consider as friends, to Silendra, um, to Fred Sin, and to Joa Chin. Great discussion, thank you so much. Um, we hope we can always count on you to get more perspectives on PFM as we continue to work on this global report. And to everybody that has contributed to, on, the, on the chat and for all participants, thanks so much for this. Uh, we hope you've been able to get some things. Please make sure you go on PIFA website and make your contributions. You can be very sure that we're going to work with um, whatever we get there. Um, I would like to especially thank my uh, special colleagues from the PIFA Secretariat who have put uh, this great work together. Um, I mean, just recognizing the fact that we have a lot of data and we can use it for this very important global report. So thanks to all the colleagues in the PEPA Secretariat and well done, kudos to you all. Um, again, to the, the colleagues who are helping us behind for the technical work for uh, the video, the review, thank you very much uh, for this. Just to mention that this conversation continues. Um, uh, we have three more lunches that is taking place. We have a French event tomorrow. We have Spanish, Spanish on 23rd and another one in English that is dedicated to the Asian and African countries taking the uh, time into consideration. So please um, help us advertise this and be a part of the great progress that we hope we can join you in making in the aspects of public financial management. So thanks again for this. It's exactly 11 a.m. and I would like to call it a day. So again, thanks everybody and do have a great day ahead. Thank you, Nikki, Sydney, right. and everyone. This was very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.